In this video, we'll be looking at off-axis digital holography. It's a relatively simple technique that you can use to measure the amplitude and phase of an optical field by interfering it with a plane wave on a camera. Say we've got some unknown optical field, which is a smiley face in this example, where the eyes and the mouth are out of phase with the head outline. If we look at that field directly on the camera, that phase information is lost, obviously. All we see is the intensity of the unknown field at each pixel. And the phase could be anything as far as the camera is concerned. In an earlier video, we looked at the gerchberg saxton phase retrieval algorithm. It's also a technique for measuring the amplitude and phase of an unknown field, except it's not really a direct measurement. It's really a guess. It's an optimization routine that finds a solution which seems to work. It's often very good, but it doesn't necessarily give you an unambiguous direct solution. Off-axis digital holography, on the other hand, unambiguously measures the phase information. It's not a guess, it's not an optimization. It's a relatively straightforward process of about four steps and then it's done. We start off with a camera image that captures the intensity of the interference between a reference plane wave and the unknown field, and we'll call the unknown field the object wave, and that's the wave you want to reconstruct numerically. That image, that interferogram, that captures the interference between the reference and the object wave, you do some Fourier processing on it, and you'll end up with a reconstructed field where every pixel has an amplitude and a phase. There's not much processing involved. It's basically just a Fourier transform, apply a filter in Fourier space, inverse Fourier transform, and then remove the tilt of the reference wave. The experimental setup is also pretty straightforward. You just interfere the beam you want to measure, so the object wave, with a reference wave. And in this video, the object wave I'll be using as an example is a Laguerre Gaussian beam. So it's a ring of azimuthal phase. I've chosen that as an example because it's the kind of beam I'm often working with, but it's also a very simple optical field which you can interpret by eye. But it could be any optical field, such as the light reflected or transmitted through an object, which is a common use case, and that's the reason it's referred to as the object wave. So you interfere the object wave with a reference wave that's coming in at a slightly different angle. And ideally, that reference wave is a plane wave, in that it should be uniform intensity, at least over the whole object wave. The reference wave can't actually be infinite in size, obviously, but it should be so big that it looks infinitely large as far as the object wave you're measuring is concerned. The object wave and the reference wave interfere on the camera, and the camera records the intensity of that interference. Zoomed in here on a part of the interferogram, we can see those fringes of interference between that tilted plane wave acting as the reference and the object wave. That tilt, that angle of incidence of the reference wave, means that you get to record the interference of each feature of the object wave with multiple different phase values of the reference. That is, for each pixel on the camera, the reference wave has a different phase due to that tilt. And from that, you get to see how the object wave interferes across multiple phase offsets and hence you can work out what the phase of the object wave is. It also means that because you need multiple camera pixels to work out each feature of the object wave, you end up measuring the amplitude and phase of the object wave with about one third of the resolution of your initial camera frame. And I'll talk about that in a bit later. However, we don't actually process the interferogram directly in the camera plane, we do it in the Fourier plane. I'll loop back around on these details again later, but Due to the tilt of the reference wave, when you Fourier transform the interferogram, you'll get something like this in the Fourier plane. The on axis region in the middle of the Fourier plane has two autocorrelation terms in it, which don't tell us anything about the object wave's phase, so we'll filter those out. And there's two off axis terms that are conjugates of one another. These do contain the phase information we want, but they're redundant, so we'll only need one of them. So we ditch the autocorrelation terms in the middle ditch one of the off-axis terms and keep one of the other off-axis terms, inverse Fourier transform it back into the plane of the camera, and now you've got the reconstructed object wave. There might also be the residual tilt of the reference wave in that reconstructed field that you'll have to remove, depending on how you did the inverse Fourier processing, but I'll talk about that more in a bit. 
But that's basically all there is to it. That's basically the steps you have to do to extract the amplitude and phase of your object wave from that interferogram. So not too many steps involved. And it's essentially the same idea as traditional analog holography, except some of the steps happen numerically in a computer rather than physically using light. We've got our object wave. We've got our reference wave. We've got our recording medium, which in traditional holography would often be some kind of photosensitive film. But for digital holography, it's a digital camera. So there's not really much difference between the two techniques here at this stage where we're recording the interferogram. The main difference is in the replay of the object wave. For traditional analog holography, that step occurs physically by illuminating the interferogram, the hologram, with the reference wave. The Fourier transforms are FFTs in digital holography, whereas the Fourier transforms are lenses and diffraction in analog holography. The Fourier filtering is numerical in digital holography and physical for analog holography, either using pinhole filters or simply by observing the relevant term from the appropriate position in the far field. Okay, now we'll look a little bit deeper at the details. All right, so we've got our object wave coming into the camera at what I'll define as straight ahead, zero degrees. And then we've got our reference beam, so a big plane wave that's coming in at a slight angle relative to the object wave uh, that we're trying to reconstruct. We can see in this animation that once the tilt in the reference wave gets large enough that the relevant off-axis terms in Fourier space can be separated from the other terms, then we can pick them off and reconstruct the field. But of course, in order for that to work, there needs to be interference. So the reference wave and the object wave must be mutually coherent, which typically would mean, or almost certainly would mean, they're coming from the same laser source. And it also means that the path length difference between the reference and the object wave are within the coherence length of the laser relative to the exposure time of your camera. I've not illustrated the beam splitter that splits the light source into the object path and the reference path. But again, if we go back to the traditional holography illustration, you can see that the illumination beam, which becomes the object beam, as well as the reference beam, are both split off from the same source. So they're mutually coherent because they both originate from the same source. We can also see here that the path length the object wave takes between the beam splitter and the recording plate in red, and the path length the reference wave takes from the beam splitter to the recording plate in green, are illustrated as being the same length. Those two paths don't have to be exactly the same length, but how much path length difference you can tolerate will depend on the coherence time slash coherence length of your light source and the exposure time of your recording medium. So in this diagram, that means how long you have to expose the film to record the hologram. If you need to expose the film for a long time to record the hologram, you'll need the relative phase between the two paths to be stable over that recording period. For digital holography, same principle applies, except it's the exposure time of your camera rather than the film. The exposure time is the time period over which the pixels on your camera are integrating power to give you the measured frame pixel value, which is not necessarily the same as the frame rate of your camera. You might have a frame rate of say 100 hertz, so that's 10 milliseconds, but an exposure time might only be 10 microseconds or 100 microseconds. The more powerful your light source and the more sensitive your camera, the shorter your exposure time will be because you won't need to capture light for that long to get all the light you need. If the phase between your reference wave and your object wave is stable over the time scale of your exposure time, but unstable compared to the frame rate of your camera, you'll see something like this. The fringes on your interferogram will be crisp with nice light and dark fringes with good contrast, but they'll be jittering back and forth all over the place randomly. But that might not be an issue as it won't necessarily affect the quality of your reconstruction. It'll just mean there's some random overall phase from one frame to the next. Now for the LG beams I'm using as an illustration here, a phase shift looks like a rotation. That's a particular property of Laguerre Gaussian beam, which is why this field looks like it's sort of rocking backwards and forwards. That's just because there's a random phase shift jittering about.
A bigger problem is if the phase is unstable during the exposure time itself. So that means there's no fixed phase relationship over the time period that the interferogram is being recorded, and hence your fringes will just be washed out and the reconstructed field will drop in power or be lost completely. Only the autocorrelation terms in the middle will survive, but the phase revealing off axis cross correlation terms of interest will die. To fix that, you'll have to fix the coherence between your reference wave and your object wave. So that means better path length matching between the reference and the object beams and or a narrower line width laser source that has a longer coherence length and or a more powerful light source and or a more sensitive camera so that you can turn down the exposure time on the camera and hence shorten the time period over which you need the phase to be stable. So all those options there are different ways of improving this phase stability over the course of the exposure time of the camera. Another point I'll make here is that with this configuration, with a beam splitter, you're actually throwing away half of your power if you don't put another camera on the other port of the beam splitter. That other port would measure the same thing, just with a different overall phase shift, and you could put two cameras on there and do a differential measurement so you don't lose power. But if we go back to the diagram of the traditional holography setup, we can see there's no extra beam splitter port that dumps light to nowhere. Everything is captured on the photographic plate. However, that photographic plate is illustrated at a very steep angle of 45 degrees relative to both beams. So that's 90 degree overall difference between the reference and the object. And at such a steep angle, that means the fringes of interference will be very closely spaced spatially. And the resolution of your film would have to be very high to capture it. Now, of course, this is just a schematic. It's not a real experimental setup and 90 degrees would be pretty extreme. But the maximum angle difference between the reference and the object wave that you'll be able to support will be set by the spatial resolution of your recording medium, be it camera or be it film. The edge of our Fourier space represents the maximum spatial frequency, which for a camera with pixels of size delta will be pi on delta, radians per meter, which can in turn be converted to a corresponding angle for whatever the operating wavelength of the light is. Notice in all the diagrams, I've illustrated the Fourier space as rectangular, matching the rectangular pixel array of the camera frame and the resulting numerical Fourier transform. But the edge of the Fourier space is the same k-max along both the x-axis and the y-axis. It's set by the pixel size. If the pixels are square, then it's the same k-max for both axes because the maximum spatial frequency that can be resolved along the x-axis and the y-axis is the same because the pixels are the same size in the x-axis and the y-axis. And for context, let's say for example, if we have a pixel size of 20 micron and an operating wavelength of 1550 nanometers, that k-max value written as an angle would be about 2.2 degrees. And 2.2 degrees is a relatively narrow range of angles to be working within which is why you often need a beam splitter, because it means that you might not be able to mechanically get the reference wave and the object wave close enough together to get them to interfere at such a small angular separation on the camera, such that your camera can actually record that interference. So the beam splitter will cost you half your light, but it'll let you get the object wave and the reference wave together at very, very close angular separations. Next, I'm going to go into the process of processing the interferogram in more detail. All right, so we've interfered the object wave with the reference wave on the camera. Camera measures the intensity, and hence the interferogram we record is the absolute squared of the interference of object plus reference. If we expand that out, we get absolute squared of the object plus absolute squared of the reference plus object times reference conjugate plus object conjugate times reference. The interferogram is the summation of the intensity of the object by itself, but no phase information there in that term, plus the intensity of the reference by itself. So there's not even any object wave information in that term at all, it's just all reference, plus these two extra terms, which are the object modulated by the reference. There's two versions 
one's the conjugate of the other. Importantly, these terms are the full complex fields of the object wave and the reference wave. They don't have those magnitude operators on them, throwing away the phase information, like the you know, O squared or R squared terms. The idea is we want to separate those off-axis terms using the tilt of the reference so that we can get the object wave information in isolation and filter out everything else. And we do that in the Fourier plane. We Fourier transform the interferogram. Now we've got the Fourier transform of those four terms, which we can write as the summation of the Fourier transform of all those four terms individually. These two terms are the autocorrelation of the object and the reference wave respectively. I've modified the color scale on this plot so that we can see all the terms at once, but the autocorrelation of the reference is just a very bright spot at the center. The Fourier transform of a plane wave is just a single spot in Fourier space. And then over the top of that is the autocorrelation of the object wave, the Fourier transform of the intensity of the object wave. No phase information in that term. It's these other off-axis cross-correlation terms which we can extract the phase information from. These other two terms are the cross-correlation between the object wave and the reference wave. We've got the Fourier transform of the conjugate of the reference multiplied by the object. Multiplication becomes convolution in the Fourier plane. So you could also rewrite that term as the Fourier transform of O, the object wave, convolved with the Fourier transform of the reference wave conjugated. But the Fourier transform of a plane wave is just a single point in Fourier space. So that term is just the Fourier transform of the object wave shifted in Fourier space to the position corresponding with the angle of the reference wave. So what I'm saying there is that that off-axis term is basically just the object wave by itself shifted off to the angle corresponding to the reference wave. There's also the conjugate term at the 180 degree rotated position in Fourier space where everything is conjugated. And this is a consequence of the Hermitian symmetry you get when you Fourier transform a real only function, like an intensity only camera image. Physically, it means you can't tell the difference between the scenario of interfering the object wave and the reference wave together and the conjugated scenario. So that's the scenario of conjugating the object and conjugating the reference and interfering them. So basically, that just means conjugating the object wave and flipping the angle of the reference, interfering those, interferogram is the same. How do you know which term is the correct one in practice? Well, when you're setting up the reference wave onto the camera, if you do it carefully, then you'll know what the angle of the reference wave is with respect to the camera, and hence you'll know the correct position in Fourier space that it corresponds with. But tracing that all through can often be a bit confusing in practice, you know, trying to work out which side of the camera is which and which way your beam is coming in. So another way to check is if you just shift the object wave in and out of focus or similarly put a long focal length lens in the object beam path and then just check that the reconstructed object wave curves the right way. If it's not, you've selected the wrong side. So either select the other side in Fourier space or equivalently just conjugate your reconstructed field. All right, we pick off that term in Fourier space, filter out everything else, and then inverse Fourier transform back into the plane of the camera to get the reconstructed field. If you just do an inverse Fourier transform of that small window centered around the cross correlation term in green, you don't have to remove any additional tilt of the reference. More on that in a second. We need to apply enough tilt with our reference wave that we can separate the autocorrelation terms at the center from the cross correlation terms off axis. But also the angle of the reference can't be so steep that the camera can't resolve it. The angle of the reference wave can't be beyond the edge of our Fourier space set by the pixel size and the wavelength. Otherwise, the fringes on the interferogram would just blur out and disappear and the whole process would fail. The camera pixels can't resolve the fringes and hence it doesn't work. In this illustration here, we can see that because I've inverse Fourier transformed the whole Fourier plane to get the reconstructed field, rather than just the region centered on the cross correlation term window, the reconstructed field still has that reference conjugated term over the top of it. That is, it's got a big tilt over it. Actually, there's so much tilt on it that it's causing some aliasing artifacts in the illustration that kind of looks like white lines. That's not real. But to remove that reference wave tilt, we can multiply the reconstructed field by the reference wave. So we have R conjugate times R, which is just a flat uniform phase everywhere. 
An equivalent way to remove it would be to shift that off axis term to the center of Fourier space. A linear phase ramp becomes a shift when you Fourier transform it. However, Fourier transforming the whole Fourier plane is redundant. It's mostly zeros. There's no information there. You only need to Fourier transform the non-zero part of the spatial spectrum in the window of interest. Numerically, that's how you should do it, as it's less computationally expensive and contains exactly the same information. But whatever approach you take, the angle of your reference wave is unlikely in practice to correspond exactly with your grid, your pixel grid in Fourier space meaning your cross-correlation terms won't necessarily be centered exactly on a pixel. It'll probably be in between pixels in Fourier space, and hence you'd have to shift by a fraction of a pixel, which means in practice you're probably just better inverse Fourier transforming it and removing the tilt in the camera plane rather than trying to shift on a sub-pixel level in Fourier space. But both ways work and you often end up having to do a bit of both. If the reference wave is not an ideal plane wave, either because it's got non-uniform intensity or it's got phase imperfections like being out of focus or it's aberrated, then you can calibrate that out of the reconstructed field. For phase imperfections, there's really no difference. You just multiply by R like you did when it was a pure tilted plane wave. To calibrate out the amplitude shaping of your reference wave, you'll have to boost the regions of the reconstruction where the reference had low power although that obviously would have its limits in practice in terms of things like dynamic range and signal to noise. If your reference has zero power at some position, you can't just magically boost it all the way back to unity. And whenever your reference wave is non-ideal, i.e. it's not a perfect plane wave, be it due to amplitude or phase imperfections, that will also cost you some spatial resolution. Because whereas a plane wave is a single point in Fourier space, other beams will contain multiple spatial frequencies, which means those off-axis cor cross-correlation terms will take up more space in Fourier space than they otherwise would need to. Let's take a look at spatial resolution now. That is, if we have a camera frame that has a certain number of pixels, it's got pixels of certain size, how much spatial resolution can your reconstructed field actually have? Now remember I mentioned earlier that you need multiple pixels of reference wave interference to work out a single feature of the object wave. So the effective pixel size in your reconstructed field will be larger than the original pixels on the camera. You need multiple camera pixels to resolve a single object wave, sort of effective pixel. In this animation, the object wave being measured is getting increasingly complicated. It has more and more fine spatial features, which in turn means more and more of the Fourier space starts to be filled. The autocorrelation terms in Fourier space get larger and the cross-correlation off-axis terms get larger until eventually they start to overlap and you can no longer separate them and the reconstruction will no longer work. We can work out the spatial frequency constraints this imposes by working out the largest circles that we can fit inside the square of our Fourier space. Now remember, I've illustrated Fourier space rectangular like the camera frames so it's a rectangular array in terms of pixels and in terms of numerically in your computer, but it's a square region of Fourier space because the pixels of the camera are square. And the distance between the center of Fourier space to the edge along each axis I've labeled in cyan, light blue, as K max. That's the maximum resolvable spatial frequency corresponding directly to the size of the pixels on the camera. Our off-axis cross-correlation term, which contains the information that we want for our reconstruction, has been moved to the far corner of Fourier space. And the window of interest containing the term is a circle of radius KW, K window. The center of the window is KW away from the edge of the y-axis and KW away from the edge of the x-axis. In the middle, we've got the autocorrelation terms. The autocorrelation of the reference is just a single point at the center. The term that actually takes up all that Fourier space in the middle there is the autocorrelation of the object wave. That autocorrelation will be twice as wide as the cross-correlation term is if the reference is a plane wave because it's the convolution of the object wave with the object wave. If you draw that up geometrically and ask what's the biggest I can make kW before those two circles touch, 
you find that the maximum value is about 0.32 of k max. So that is the pixel size in your reconstructed field will be approximately three times wider and higher than your original camera frame pixels were. However, you can actually squeeze a little bit extra resolution out of it by wrapping around in the Fourier space. So in this illustration, we've pushed the center of the Fourier window all the way to the edge along one of the axes, such that it actually wraps around now. And that will still work, and now you're up at the very limits, which will give you a window that could have a radius up to 0.39 kmax, rather than before it was 0.32 kmax. And you can wrap around either on the x-axis or the y-axis, either is fine, but what you can't do is wrap around on both axes at the same time or any other kind of wrapping that causes the two cross-correlation terms to collide with one another. Here we can see it's wrapped on both the x-axis and the y-axis, which means that now the cross-correlation term and the conjugate of the cross-correlation term are now being combined in the same window, which means our reconstruction is now the superposition of the object wave and the conjugate of the object wave, which isn't what we want. We just want the object wave. Okay, thanks for listening. Hopefully that's a convenient introduction to both the numerical processing aspects of how you perform off-axis digital holography, as well as some of the practical concerns like coherence and non-ideal reference waves and spatial resolution limits.